forward. Okay, hi everybody, this is Gila Glassberg, and today I have Chevy Stamet. Hi, Chevy. Hi. How are you? I can't believe we're finally doing this. It feels so like, how many months have we been trying to it's actually been, coordinate this? Yes, this has been long overdue. And it might have even been like pre-COVID. I think you were supposed to be my first guest, and this is my 32nd episode, so. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. They're late than never. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I hope it's going to be worth the wait. Yes, it's going to be worth it's going to be worth the wait, and I'm really excited to have you on, even though I don't see you. Okay. Huh? Um. Okay. So I don't Chevy, know what I just did. You're good. It's all good. So Chevy, I'm going to ask you to tell everyone a little bit about yourself, but I'm just going to say the reason why I brought you on is because first of all, you're a teacher, right? Right. But, and you have a a really fun Instagram account, and you like to teach people about all different types of things. Which all the things, things. <laughs> all the things. It's fun. It's entertaining. It's like I really enjoy. Um, I've I've asked you to be my own personal teacher, <laughs> <laughs> which has been really fun and also really fun to coordinate with all. With all. Uh, yes, I I yes. Yeah. Public apology for all of the scheduling hiccups, but yeah. No, it's mom life. It's mom life. It's all good. <laughs> Going on mom life, and um, but you but something also unique about you is that you would say that you are a chronic dieter and that you've been right. introduced to intuitive eating. And right. So, so you tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey with intuitive eating. Okay. So a little bit about myself. I'm a Jewish woman, a mother, a wife. We're not going in any particular order. Jewish woman comes first, a mother, a wife, a teacher, um, a friend, a neighbor, a community member. You know, um, I think I'm like a lot of women. We're just, we're a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, my personal kind of journey with intuitive eating, it's interesting. I kind of stumbled upon it before it became like popular. <laughs> mm -hmm. I feel like sometimes people think intuitive eating is like two years old. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really not. But yeah, I chronic dieter. And I've actually, you know, like I've spoken about this on other podcasts also um, that I just, you know, I grew up in a home that was very health conscious. Both my parents are physicians. Um, not overly, not like a, you know, crazy restrictive environment, but definitely what I now recognize in retrospect was fat phobic. Um, and understandably for, you know, the context growing up in like the eighties, nineties, fat is your enemy, you know, cardiac health was like, that was like really front and center. Um, so, you know, I don't say this with any kind of like anger. We have a, we have a co-host. Co um, but, um, you know, and I have permission to share this. I have two sisters and two brothers. Both my sisters um, struggled with eating disorders at different points in their life. Um, and I'm the middle of three sisters. Um, like I kind of, you know, they, they sandwich me. Um, so I was kind of sandwiched by eating disorders. Um, my, my older sister is a bit older than me. My younger sister is a little more, like, you know, more significantly younger than me. So I kind of was really surrounded by it, like in my adolescence and then like early, like adulthood, my younger sister, it was just something I was really, really exposed to. Um, and I personally, I, I was totally a chronic dieter. Always, no matter how much I weighed, I always wanted to weigh 15 pounds less. Like, I don't know what it is about the number 15. That's the number we're afraid of gaining. That's the number we always want to lose. But that was like my entire life. Um, I wouldn't say that I was, you know, like super focus on any one particular diet. Um, you know, I just was always like watching what I ate and always, you know, like restrictive and then overeating. What does that even mean? Just eat as much as you need. But that's kind of how I, I looked at it. And I, my main struggle that actually still really stays with me till today is that exercise was always punitive. Exercise was always how you earned your calories. Until today, that I think is like kind of the last piece of my journey that still hasn't fully, fully fallen into place of, you know, like joyful movement. Um, so, and that's kind of like, you know, how I, 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 and I thought that was normal. Like that was normal. And I look back at different times in my life where I was thinner, where I was heavier. Um, and all of it like makes sense now in context, like, oh, well in this picture, 
you have a three month old baby. Oh, well in this picture, you know, you're like at the beginning of a pregnancy and like vomiting constantly. So like, obviously, you know, it, but in those moments, I did not have any of that perspective of like why I was the size that I was. It was always like, uh, what is wrong with you that you are this size? And what can I do to be 15 pounds lighter? And I remember even when I was at my, my thinnest in the context of my marriage, and I can remember exactly when it was, I still wanted to be 15 pounds lighter. And now I'm like, oh, if only I were that, if only I weighed that much now, you know? Um, but, you know, fast forward, like I said, I thought that this was totally normal. Um, fast forward to when my daughter was born almost eight years ago. And I had this like moment in the hospital. I had two boys first and then I had a daughter and I had this moment where I was like, I don't want her to battle with all of the things that I, that I battled with my whole life, you know? Um, not all of it was eating, by the way. You know, there were other things. I don't want her to be exposed to this and I want her to have this confidence and I want her, like all of my, you know, hopes and dreams and every, like, like I looked at my daughter, I'm like, she's gonna be my healing, <laughs> you know? Like as a woman, right? I'm gonna, she, I'm gonna give her everything that she needs to grow into the woman that I wish I didn't have to struggle to be. Not that I didn't become, because I, I, I like to think that I eventually did, but you know, I don't want it to be so hard for her. And I would say like in the top three things was definitely relationship with food. Um, because at that point I already started to realize like there's something wrong with how much responsibility and how much like, I don't know if responsibility is even the right word, but really like guilt and shame and like punishment um, surrounded my food choices. It was always a thing and I was devoting so much energy to it. Um, but it still took several years for me to get to a place of like real intuitive eating. That definitely sparked my interest in division of responsibility. Um, Cause I was like, okay, this isn't about me. I'm, I'm, I'm lost, I'm a lost cause. This is me for the rest of my life. But for my children, and I also um, had one child at the time who was like a pickier eater. Um, one child was totally fine. So I was like, you know what? D-O-R. This is how we're going to be feeding the kids. And it was actually through those principles that I found myself kind of adopting some of those principles, you know, for myself. Like, well, if I'm letting my children decide if they want to eat and how much they want to eat, why am I not giving myself that same permission? Like, I'm a mature adult, right? Mm -hmm. So like, why, why can't I take all of those principles and apply them to myself? And I still had never heard of intuitive eating. It still took like a while. I was, you know, and, and even like when it comes to DOR, so, you know, we mentioned this just before, like as much as I appreciate like structure, I really do. I think there's real value in structure, but I am a little bit of like a rebel. If you give me like too rigid of a structure, which is part of the reason, I mean, addition, like in addition to the fact that like diets don't work, um, part of the reason that I could never keep to one was because there was always this like, don't tell me what to do. I feel like deep down, I always knew that it wasn't normal for somebody else to tell me how much to eat and what to eat when. Um, I will say that a really crucial part of my journey towards intuitive eating, because I don't think I'm there. Like when people are like, oh, are you an intuitive eater? I'm like, sometimes <laughs> on Tuesdays, you know, like not always. Hi, gorgeous. Um, so a really actually crucial step for me was um, when I found like the macro movement right? The like, if it fits your macros way of eating. And I don't know, you know, people are familiar with it, but one of the fundamental principles of it is that anything can fit into your macros. It's about the choices that you make. So um, for me, and I, I, and I ate that way probably, that was like the longest diet I was ever able to keep to of all the diets. I mean, the others lasted like three days if you were lucky. Like, you know, some people are like, I could diet for a month. I'm like, how, how, how do you diet for a whole month? Yes. I was never able to do that. But if I think your macros was one that I was really able to like stick to for the longest amount of time, because inherent in the diet is a certain degree of flexibility. And I think it's the only, and I'm not saying that it's, I mean, it's still a diet. Like I'll be like, let's be hundred percent clear. It is still a diet um, because you're still counting and you're still tracking and you're still letting external factors determine how much you're going to eat. But it was the only diet that had a certain amount of flexibility. I guess maybe Weight Watchers also, but like, I tried that also. Um, and that was really important also because of the focus on like macronutrients and like you actually were 
it was the first time in my life that I was paying attention to the different nutrients that I was eating. So when it came to like incorporating gentle nutrition, and by the way, like I did not do the steps in order when it comes to intuitive eating and I still kind of don't. Um, and I think that like, it's a, it's a, it's a misconception that you will very almost like, you know, stages of grief, you know, that you will just like, yes, see, that's so linear. It's not linear at all. There are times where I'm like, whoa, am I still challenging like the diet police? Like, how are we still there? Shouldn't they have been muted already? Um, but it's not like that. Let me just interrupt you for a second. Yeah. Especially when it comes to like using food to punish yeah. or, or any of those things if yeah. that's like your go-to when yeah. you're coping so like yeah even if you you become an intuitive eater you or you believe in intuitive eating it's very normal to fall back on your old habits so that's just very normal yeah yeah and food I totally use I mean that was like I mean it still is for me one of my like top you know coping coping things um and, and I realize that sometimes that's totally, that's totally okay. You know, like this is, this is, this is what I need, like, you know, this is what I need right now. So yeah, I definitely kind of cycled in, in, in like a weird kind of order. Um, but, but I think I was able to incorporate gentle nutrition. I would say like earlier because like, I really had that like nutrition, like I was, I've always been really interested in nutrition. And when it comes to like feeding my family, like I got really into like, okay, how do I ensure that like, you know, they're getting the nutrients that they need and, you know, but, but it's also like satisfying and filling and you know, so, you know, like I had lists in my phone of like all the different like ideal snacks, you know, not just that were like healthy, but like nutritious mm -hmm. so so that was really a help for me um so i you know i can't say that there's any like Baruch Hashem, i'm at the point where, like there's no part of my journey that i'm like oh i regret that i had to go through that because all of it was really necessary but that's kind of how you know my daughter's born like she's almost eight so that's really you know kind of where the journey started for me and i would say that like into like eating intuitively really like incorporating that for me started probably around four years ago and how did you so you kind of like in, intuitively knew about intuitive eating and then how did you, right. Have, right? Yeah. So at first I didn't know about, you know, the intuitive eating, anything like not, none of the books, none of the courses, nothing. Um, and I started just, you know, applying DOR to myself, like division of responsibility to myself, mostly by asking myself, um, you know, like, well, what do I want to, like, how much of this do I want to eat? Because, you know, it would when you're in that kind of cycle of like, you know, restriction and then, and then, you know, the opposite of restriction. I don't love the word binge, you know, but like, but okay. Um, you know, so that I would be the kind of person where I would like save up my cheats. Right. And then of course, if I was eating something that wasn't part of my normal, my normal diet, um, then I'd, I'd have to eat all of it, you know, like, well, if it's, if it's, if today's a dessert day, right. you better finish every single bite on your plate. Cause like, who knows when you'll have an, an opportunity to do this again. And I started kind of applying still, by the way, in a very, um, judgmental way saying like, okay, how much of this do you really want to eat? Have you reached fullness yet? You know, like the kind of questions that I would ask my kids, like, what does your tummy feel like? Recognizing that hunger cues aren't only like felt as hunger, mm -hmm. right? I'm tired, I'm cranky, I'm, you know, whatever other things that I'm not really able to focus, like, oh, that's also hunger. Um, and then I would say uh, probably about three years ago, I think it was probably through, in it must have been through Instagram that I like stumbled upon. I'm like, oh, this is a thing. Right. This is like an actual thing. I didn't, who knew, right? right. Um, so I immediately like ordered the intuitive, which I think is, it's at least one edition ago. I should probably yeah. get the updated one because they're constantly updating it. And I think also when I, re and then, so I realized it's a thing. I ordered the book and I started, you know, Googling and there were so many blogs and different things. And, and one of the things that I loved so much, I like could just, and, and as this kind of, as like a, you know, as an educator and as a more intellectually, you know, minded person, the fact that there were so many editions of the book mm -hmm. to me was like, oh, they're constantly updating it. Mm -hmm. That means that this is real science. Right, right. Because real science, and I know we, you know, we live in a day and age where like, it's hard for people to really wrap their heads around this, but if something is actually scientific, 
it's by definition not static because mm -hmm. you don't have the information today that you're going to have tomorrow or in a year or in five years. So your, you know, your science is as accurate as it can be given everything that you currently know. Um, but there's also the recognition that you will discover things that will, you know, further shape your understanding of this idea. So the fact that there were so many editions of the book to me was like, okay, this is real. Right. Uh, and the, new, the newest version just came out in June. And yeah. I actually, I, one of the things I say, like, I think about a lot is that when Evelyn Triboli and Elise Rush wrote the book, which was in the 1990s, like, they didn't know that in 2020, where it would be today. And they, like, I know in the first book, they did mention numbers and weight, and now they don't mm -hmm. mention it at all. And I just right. want to say for anyone who's, you know, trying it, starting it, trying something new at all, like, you don't have to have all the answers. Like, they right. didn't, right? And look how it evolved. Right. And look at all the yeah. research on intuitive eating now. So, that's just yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I just... I think also what made it so, and even then, by the way, like I remember I was, I, I was, I was interviewed on a pad, podcast, I think like a year and a half ago. And I actually said in the podcast, and sometimes people will still get back to me and they're like, I heard that podcast, I heard you say this. I said, like, I can't promise that I will never diet again. Mm -hmm. I remember you. I that. can't promise I will never diet again. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll tell you very honestly, like, I can't promise. I'll right. say it again now. Like, I can't promise I'll never diet again. I for sure know that I'll feel the desire to diet again, you know, right. like. So normal, so normal. So normal, it's so mm -hmm. normal. Like, you know, my son's bar mitzvah is coming up and it's like, yeah, this like internal battle of like, it's not worth it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not worth it. Don't step on that scale, don't, mm -hmm. you know, like, and like, I have to, I have to go, I'm like, what, what information will, how will this positively impact you? If you know what you weigh today, then what? Then what will you do with that information? Mm -hmm. And I know what I'll do with that information. I'll start berating myself and punishing myself and, you know, dictating to myself what I can and cannot have. You know, just yesterday, by the way, I had such an interesting experience. I was sharing this with a friend. So yesterday I had kind of like an off day. Was it yesterday? I think so. Yeah, it was like a little bit of, yeah, it was like a little bit of like a me day, you know? Um, and, you know, part and parcel of those kinds of like pampering, low key type of days for me was always like, ooh, what are you going to have for lunch, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and it for sure was going to be like, like a, like a cheat type of food. It's like, oh, if you have all of these hours and you're just, so I, I yesterday was just, thought, I'm like, so what do I want to eat? Do I want like Chinese food? Do I want like a hamburger? Maybe I should go to the pizza shop. Like what good food? And by the way, you can do that totally intuitively, intuitively also. Like the ideas are like, yeah, today's an off day. Like what's going to feel good today? And sometimes the answer is those foods. But I also had kind of like a headache and was feeling like not perfect yesterday. And I was able to kind of like be like, okay, well, what do you, what do you, what will you really benefit from now? Like, what do you actually need? And I was like, you know what I actually need? Like a light, nutritious, like, like hydrating lunch, <laughs> you know, like that's really what I need. Like, I don't need food now that's going to be like sodium heavy and like really like dehydrate me even more because I could tell already that I was feeling like headachey and thirsty and whatever. So I, was, so I went home and I just like, and I made myself something else. And I was like, it, it's so breathtaking when it happens. Like it never gets old. It never gets old. I'm like, I can't believe that. Mm -hmm. And it's a win but it's not a win the way it would have been three, four years ago. It's not a win because I made the more nutritious choice as opposed to the choice that was more just like tasty or, you know, treat, play food, whatever. Mm -hmm. It was a win because it was an honest response to my body's needs. And when I say body, I don't just mean physical body, like my entire self's needs. It was an honest response. And I think it was intuitive, right? Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes the win is the opposite. Sometimes the win is like, you don't want an orange, you want a cookie. Right. You know? Right. And I think that those wins kind of get highlighted a lot because we're still very, very much, I think like as a culture, we're still very much in the early stages of intuitive eating. And that's why there's a lot of misconception of like, oh, you eat intuitively, like you live on French fries, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a lot of misconception around that because that's, that's like, 
that's like the necessary step in order to like remove all judgment from food. Um, but that's not like, you don't stay there. That's not, you know, you're not, you're not supposed to stay there because that's also not intuitive. That's also just like constantly responding to your cravings and this like knee jerk reaction. Um, that's also not intuitive because that's not taking into consideration like so many other factors. Um, I'm also always so shocked at how quickly it happens. Like that didn't take me hours. I didn't have to journal about it. It was like three minutes, mm -hmm. you know, that I like went through this process of like, no, wait, hold on. That's not, and I'm always like astounded at how like practiced I am in it, you know? Um, I want to know, start, sorry, yeah. I, I want people to know that, um, what you're highlighting is really the nuance, right? Like, yeah. And, and the mindfulness, a lot of things. And like, and that it's not, a, it's not linear at all. There's no really, it's not like a rhyme or rhythm type of thing. Like, yes, right. there, is, there is a backbone structure, but like, yeah. if you would have, if you would have decided to have the Chinese food, it would have been okay. Also, you might have had more right. of a break and said, right. next time, next time I'm going to try to have right. some there, right? right? But right. You know, really just to, to notice that, like what you said before, I wrote down some words, like the permission, the responsibility, right. without judgment, like, yeah. Okay, like this is what my body needs now and I'm going to listen to yeah. it when I can. Yeah. And I would have thought, you know, it's interesting, like going back a couple of years, or I would say even more recently than that, a year and a half, two years ago, um, or depending on the day, maybe even yesterday, if I would have chosen the Chinese food and then like felt like not so great, I would have perceived it as a mistake. Right. Oh, you made a mistake, Chevy. Next time you'll choose better. Right. And now it's like, no, 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 no. That's not a, that's not a mistake. Mm -hmm. It was a choice. Right. And now that choice gave me information. And with that information, I may or may not make a different choice next time. Mm -hmm. But there are no mistakes when it comes to intuitive eating. To me, that was like, because when you're on a diet or you're watching yourself or you're on a, you know, I, I did lifestyles also just by the yeah, way. Like right. I went through a period, especially because I, you know, where, I mean, and now I think this is gaining more traction because like the, the whole concept of orthorexia is actually becoming like more like known. Mm -hmm. um, and it was not, it wasn't like that for me, but I definitely went through a period of time, like a couple of years where like I was obsessed with clean eating and nutritious eating and, you know, what I put into my kids' bodies and what I allowed in my bodies. And I was like, and my body, and I was really strict about it. And then of course it was like, no, 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 80, 20, <laughs> you know? And like, this is, and uh, like, and my husband and I did it together. He's also like, it's, it's it, like, we both grew up in like wholesome nutrition type of like homes. So we both like, like a lot of vegetables and, you know, like salads and, you know, so sometimes it's like, you can even convince your, like, you can almost talk yourself into like that what you're doing is in a diet. And sometimes like, I have to question like, okay, if I'm planning a meal for my family, I'll be like, wait, 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 like, am I allowing like those tendencies to like rear their head again? Or is this coming from a place of like, no, this is good food for all of us. You know, mm -hmm. like I didn't fry schnitzel for like five years, mm -hmm. you know, like I, and I bred it in an almond flour and I had like, you know, all the ingredients from like kamut to um you know to to everything i and, and i and, and i have to kind of like detox that from a while but like i still do have like flax and chia seeds in my pantry now and like we use them and they're good and like they have their place but like for a while i had to be like none of that i think i had like six months where i was like none of that right. um but yeah, the, that, the whole thing is like a journey and, and, and that, so yeah, it would be very like, oh, that's a mistake. You know, you made a mistake next time you'll choose better. And that still has that undertone of like, naughty, naughty. <laughs> so that's you actually know? like a really, a good point. And we could even segue into like LL and Chuva and all that stuff. That yeah. I but I want to say that the, the reason why I love intuitive eating, I love it for a lot of reasons. But um, one thing that you said is like that instead of looking at this as a mistake, it's just a choice and you could make a, the right. same or a different choice, but it's, it's like data. Like I, yeah. I have this, you know, I write, I write on my bedroom wall and I wrote like failure equals data. I really like that. Yeah. It doesn't even have to be the word, yeah. failure, but like just that's where intuitive yeah. spills over into like all areas of our lives where we have like that rigidity that's like suffocating us. And yeah, this is not rigid. Yeah. And, and yeah. it, you know, that's why it speaks to so many like perfectionists, like, the rigidity only serves us to some extent, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. you, you can't really like, you know, 
rely to like on, on the food rules mm -hmm. that for so many of us make us feel safe around food. And the reason we need to feel safe around food is because we don't trust ourselves around food. A false, right? a false sense of faith, right? Right, exactly, exactly. Right. So I wanted to, I, I love your, your perspective on Judaism. I feel like it's also very nice and maybe like what we're missing a little bit in the, in the room world. I don't know. Not just my fingers. At it's hard. It's hard to teach nuance. I always say like, it has to be modeled mm -hmm. kind of like empathy, you know, like you can't really teach nuance. You have to model nuance and you have to share from a place of nuance. And I think that's how our kids and our students learn it. Um, that's hard to do in a classroom setting or in a, you know, in a family with so many different family members because nuance is going to look different for every single person. Um, so yeah, just to like, you know, defend. <laughs> that's really interesting. Because like, yeah. even when you said like to go on a different subject, but like, let's say empathy, right? Like yeah. you can't teach empathy, you can just model it. Like there are people who are naturally um, empaths, right? Like it's just yeah. their makeup and then yeah. there are people who are like, so 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 not and they have other strengths but like right and new something like nuance like how if, if you can't teach it in the classroom and you can't teach it in a big family because there's so many kids yeah. like is that even like a realistic expectation to be taught so i don't know that it can't be taught um the same way like empathy can be taught but it has to be on a foundation of modeling right if you're teaching empathy but you're never modeling empathy then like that's never going to be enough Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and I think the same, the same is true for, for nuance. I, I mean, I think part of it is we never, you know, we never kind of graduate from a certain like juvenile kindergarten esque perception of certain things, you know, um, because while kids can certainly pick up on a certain degree of nuance, they're not as, you know, de developed as an adult in terms of their capacity. So when we teach things, let's take an LL concept like, um, you know, the scale, right? And you have like mitzvos and averos, right? Mm -hmm. So you're like, you know, our kids come home with these like construction paper scales mm -hmm. and we want more malachim on this side and not malachim. Mm -hmm. And then we're walking around as like 25, 40, 65 year olds with these like construction paper yeah. scales in our mind. Mm -hmm. And it's like, at a certain point, our understanding of bigger concepts needs to evolve, like, you know, together with our development and our life experience and everything else. Like, Torah is not kindergarten. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> More time. One second. <laughs> um, so, you know, so I, I think kind of that's part of it. And we want to obviously teach these ideas to our children. And that's, a, that's an age appropriate way to give them that visual and to explain that concept, um, you know, and there's good and there's bad. Um, but like that, that should have, I, I firmly believe that that should evolve over time. And I think that that's where we're kind of like experiencing a hiccup. You know, um, that like a lot of us as, as adults are like hearing certain things or like, I, you know, I have this a lot on Instagram that I'll phrase certain things and I'll get a message like, I never heard it phrased that way. And I'm like, welcome to your 20s. Welcome right. to your 30s. Welcome to adulthood. Right. Like, welcome to nuance. Um, maybe it's because our schooling, our formal schooling ends around the age when our frontal lobe becomes fully developed and we're more capable of like, you know, developing that nuance. And just at that time, we're like, eh, school's out. Right. Um, and we get and busier and busier. Right. Right. I mean, maybe, maybe that's a part of it and not everybody is like, you know, an intuitive learner, mm -hmm. um, which I, I mean, I, I'm very passionate about that. Like I want to, I want to develop my students' intuition. I want them to become learners. I don't want my students to be reliant on me forever and always that like I'm their portal for information. Like, like I just want to inspire them to continue to learn on their own and then they could like outgrow me and surpass me. Like that's my greatest dream, you know? Yeah. Um, but I think that there are certain things about our current system that don't necessarily encourage or support that. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. So I want to talk about, um, let's say, so let's say like now that, okay, guilt and shame is a big part of dieting, right? Yes. And with intuitive eating and health at every size, and we have sort of like take, trying to take the judgment out of eating, trying to yeah. take the moral judgment, right? And I wanted to parallel that a little bit with like Judaism, it's like so different, but I wanted to know like, like what, we, what we're learning of, a lot about in the research is that like, 
a certain degree of guilt isn't really like good for us. Like it makes us feel worse about ourselves. We indulge in it. We stay stuck. Ironically, we continue to do those behaviors that are making us feel guilty, right? Yeah. There is like a, I'm sure there is a place for guilt in Judaism and that sort of like comes up. Am I wrong? Like what in LL? Well, there's a, there's a place. Can we call it regret? We could call it regret. Could you like, not not because I want to just make this about semantics, but I think that mm-hmm. sometimes if we define our terms, what we mean by guilt is that like shameful getting stuck inability to like move forward. And like you said, ironically, just like repeating those, it's almost like our brain seeking that chaos of guilt, yeah. you know, because yeah. it just feels uh, comfortable to us. Mm-hmm. Um, even though it's really uncomfortable, it's just, it's known. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas regret, I think is kind of that same in- information. You know, like, hmm, how do I feel post that behavior, saying that, doing that? Like, regretful. You know, I actually just, this happened recently. I got a voice note from a friend of mine who told me, she said, you know, I was thinking about a conversation that we had. And in the course of the conversation, she, she had asked me a question and I answered. And her response to that answer, um, she felt was like derogatory towards like a specific person. Mm-hmm. Um, I, 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 and I kind of like, I didn't like absorb that at all. I didn't interpret it that way at all. And like, I had context for all of it. So it kind of, it didn't really stick in my mind at all, but she sent me a voice note like a week later. And she's like, you know, think about that conversation. And like, I should not have said that. Like, I realized that, you know, and the way, the way she phrased it also was like, so like mature and growthful and like evolved. She was like, you know, I'm reflecting on this conversation and there was really no need for me to like express that the way I did. Um, you know, and, and I apologize if it left any kind of like negative perception in your mind about this person. Like, I'm definitely going to think about how I can be more mindful in the future to like not respond in that way. And I was like, that, that is chuba. I feel like that's not regret. I feel like that's reflective. I hate the word. That is, but what, what prompted her reflection? There's that moment of like, ugh. Mm-hmm. But you like, don't say stuck in it. You can don't you describe stuck the in feeling it. of it. Like, is it regret? Let's say it's like similar to the feeling of like, you know, you just like the the post Chinese food coma. Okay. Mm-hmm. And by the way, I don't know if people know this, but it actually is possible to eat, um, you know, an appropriate portion <laughs> of Chinese food. It doesn't feel that way, and that you know, but it has to do sometimes. Maybe it's the MSG. Um, but like. It's crazy. I've Chinese done it like food. once or twice. Yeah, I love Chinese food. I'm going to just say that. I love Chinese food too. And one of the things I love about it is like eating it and then being so full and then like 15 minutes later being like, I'm hungry again. Like that's part of the experience. But if when you have, in that moment, when you like feel like, oh, that was too much, right? Um, you have, So that could either be like, I'm not feeling so good with myself right now. And okay. that prompts reflection. And what came to mind in my head is sort of like um, a spectrum. Yes. This just came to me, right? So you're, let's say you eat the Chinese food and um, you, you go from like something like here to like regret to like guilt. But I don't know what the word is that's before the regret. It, it, it's like regret is too heavy for me. I think I've become like, I have these like aversions to these words. Yeah. Yeah. So why can't we just call it like a, a prompt to reflect? Like, what's that prompt? Yeah. What is it? You know, um, do we have to give it a word. Discomfort. What'd you say? Discomfort. Discomfort. Yeah. It can be discomfort. Yeah, totally. Totally. Because again, discomfort is not, it's not bad to be uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. It's, in, it's information. Right. 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 Like there are times where you're uncomfortable and, and it's so, that's such a necessary, I don't, I mean, emotionally, physically, it's so necessary because it's giving your body information. I'll give you an example. I, I burnt my hand yesterday, like boiling water splashed on my hand. Okay. So I like immediately put it under water and my mother-in-law is like queen of getting burned. <laughs> she's like, I always see her with like silver dime and potatoes on her hands and things like that. Um, 
And I, you know, so she tells me, okay, you have to keep your hands under, not freezing cold, but cool water, keep it in cool water until all of the heat comes out of your hands. And she's, and if that doesn't work, she's giving me other things, honey, potatoes, whatever. The point is to dry out the heat. And mm -hmm. I said to her, how am I going to know that the heat is totally drawn out? She said, because when you take your hands out of water, if the heat isn't fully drawn out, you'll still feel that like it'll be more mild, but you'll feel that burning sensation. Mm -hmm. So that discomfort, right, has a real purpose. It's telling me, get your hand back in water. You're mm -hmm. not done yet, right? There's still heat in here. You don't want it to blister. You don't want it. So discomfort like should really be welcomed because um, it, it gives us so much information about what we're experiencing and also about what our next steps should be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? It's yeah. really, really like practical in that way. That makes sense. Um, um, you know, and take it like with anything, like, mm -hmm. I don't know, I'm nursing my baby, right? Mm -hmm. um, how do I, you know, let sometimes, I, this happens to me all the time, especially like in the morning, you wake up in the morning, you can't remember which side you last nursed on, right? So you mm -hmm. try one side and you're like, ooh, the other side is like feeling like really uncomfortable. That's information. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Switch your baby to the other side. Like, you know, and we should welcome it, but we're still like, ooh, ooh, discomfort. No, 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 no. That's like not an optimal state to be in. We should always be comfortable because comfortable is easy. And when there's ease, there's calm. And uncomfortable doesn't have to be chaotic. It could just be like, and I think that the, the key like differentiator there in terms of our response is, are we curious or are we resistant? So I was just going to say, are we curious or are we judging? And right. L is about right. judgment, though. It is about judgment. What's about judgment? L, right? So when we say judgment, right, like, again, do we have, like, a very kindergarten, like, perspective on it? When we say, like, Hashem is judging us, or we're supposed to judge. Like, a lot of times we talk about making a cheshbon hanefesh, right? Or, like, this concept of cheshbon, right? So cheshbon literally means, like, accounting. Mm -hmm right which is essentially a reflection which gather is. the data gather all the data what have you done how have you felt what you know what have been the ramifications of those choices gather the data right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and now process it synthesize it mm -hmm. why do we have to be why can't we be curious about ourselves as opposed to judgmental of ourselves I'm because the judgment, I mean, again, I don't want to get caught in the semantics of it. I think but the, the semantics judgment, are important, actually. Yeah, but the judgment doesn't really get us anywhere if it's that kind of like, you know, like Heaviness. shameful, yeah. you know, like harsh kind of judgment, mm -hmm. right? Um, and the truth is, and when Hashem judges us, I mean, like, what does that even really mean? Like, Hashem knows what we did and he knows why we did it. So mm -hmm. it's really like giving us the opportunity, right? He's giving us the structure to become curious about our own selves and our own behavior. Hashem yes. doesn't need us. He right. doesn't need our mitzvahs. He does, he does, this is not, right? This is not for his benefit. He doesn't gain anything, um, you know, by like giving us this, this rhythm of Elul and Shuva and, right? Mm -hmm. It's really, it's really for us because like, if we don't have this built into our calendar, this like reflection time, you know, mm -hmm. when's the last time we actually reflected? Right. right. You know? so, so you're, you're kind of taking a lot of, you're making it very neutral, the accounting, accounting of yourself as opposed to like negative. Well, I think it or, is neutral. I I'm think it is neutral in the sense that, um, you know, it's neutral in the sense that it's in, that it's giving you information. And I think that what neutralizes it is actually this idea of kapara, right? Which we experience on Yom Kippur, right? So every single day in Shemona Esrei, we talk about slicha and mechila, right? Slach lanu, lanu, and Yom Kippur has an added dimension of kapara. And we, this is like a whole... This is like literally a whole like two period class that I give, but mm -hmm. Kapara is exclusive to Yom Kippur because what Kapara does is, is essentially like wipes the slate clean. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so we have that experience. So that, cause it kind of, it neutralizes everything that came before. Mm -hmm. It's not that things don't have consequences, right. right? That's like saying, it's not like, oh, you're an intuitive eater. You eat French fries every day. That's not without consequence. Mm -hmm. But does the consequence like imp impact your worth as a person? 
let's say you eat french fries every single day, right? And you now exist in a very large body, right? Mm -hmm. You are still worthy. You are still loved. You still deserve respect. You are still cherished, right? All of those things. It doesn't compromise who you are. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where, like, that's where the similarity really lies. We could, you know, again, I want to stay away from the word judgment and let's, let's use it as like an evaluation and assessment and accounting, right? And I think that the ability to view it more neutrally is crucial because when we talk about judgment, that immediately goes straight to work. Um, Brene Brown has an amazing podcast episode with David Kessler on grief. And one of the things he says is judgment demands punishment. I don't know if that line stood out to you. It's literally, I'm like, it might be an Instagram post. Judgment demands punishment. Hmm. And it was like, whoa, yes, that's so, 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 like it really hit home for me. Like when we judge ourselves and when we judge others, it demands a punitive response, right? Hmm. Versus like, that more curious approach of like, I am worthy, you are worthy, right? We, we, we are bound to, you know, make choices that don't reflect our worthiness over the course of the year. But don't worry, right? We have the chance to start over and over and over. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you a question. You said before that you're like naturally more of a rebel, a rebel right? Do you, yeah. <laughs> as, I'm, as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking, I'm so naturally inclined to feel guilt. Like, do you think this is a personality thing that, that like I need to be rewired? And because I, it's not just me. I know it's not just me. Right. And I think that I could be, I could be wrong if you just be mine. Well, I do think obligers, I think obligers lean towards guilt. I'm not an obliger. I'm a questioner. Hmm. Yeah. Um, definitely, I'm definitely okay. not an obliger, but I want right. to say, let's say, let's say, maybe this is just my experience, but my experience in the, in the very, in the very orthodox firm world is that there is a overarching theme of guilt, strict, yeah. heavy, yeah. And, yeah. and people yeah. subscribe to it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because there's safety in that. Mm -hmm. There's a hundred percent, there's safety in that. Um, and I think this is also where, and this is kind of a separate conversation, you can have the spiritual underpinnings and energy of something, and then you kind of have like the practical application of it or the halakha of it or whatever it is. Um, and I think that this is kind of what happens when we take very big ideas and we dumb them down to make, like we kind of turn them into sound bites. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and so, and that's what we do in kindergarten. What is Elul about? What does the shofar mean? What is this, right? Mm -hmm. We're supposed to grow in our Judaism. And again, like, I, I'm not looking to throw our whole community under the bus, but, but, I, but I definitely do agree with you that we require a lot more nuance in our education. I think that, you know, the guilt served generations before us it was, it, it was enough to keep people in line. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it was right, mm -hmm. but, but you know, when you think about like, okay, what kept people who were not so learned and were not so, you know, informed, what kept that, what kept them connected to the Torah community is that like social pressure and that sense of community, right? What made Maishi the water carrier stop his work on Shabbos when he didn't even know how to read well, everybody around what's going to happen to me if I don't so I don't there, there is sorry <laughs> there is like a, a certain degree of benefit um in that kind of pressure and I think it does come along with some guilt but I also think that as a community we've we're outgrowing it and we need to catch up with that and be like, wait, there's so much access mm -hmm. to information. There's so much. And does that maybe come along with a certain degree of permissiveness? Will people, you know, kind of like how in the beginning you eat all the chips, mm -hmm. right? Until you're like, wait, 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 wait. Maybe, maybe that's something that our community needs to experience. And I always like, I always say to people like, Hashem can accept us with all of our mistakes. Like, why can't we do that for each other? Mm -hmm. You know, why is it like either you're this or you're out? That's really, really fear driven, you know? And I think we're better than that. 
I think we're better than that. The Torah is stronger than that. We cannot live that. We cannot last that. Um, you know, so to me, it's just like, yeah. And we might need an episode too, because yeah, tell me when you have to go. Yeah. Because, like, well, yeah. Well, we have to. We have. Yeah. You're done. I think so. Because if I if we don't if we don't pause now, then I won't be able to eat before I teach. Okay, so we're gonna. Go and like, how could we have an episode of like intuitive eating where like you know, the the guest is not eating. <laughs> You must be eating, of course. No, seriously. Thank you for coming on. Yeah. This is going to come out before Rosh Hashanah. Oh, great. Okay, and amazing. Then, and we will do, in six months, we're going to do a... No, Hopefully, joking. maybe we could do, like, another one, like, sooner. Because it's, yeah. like, Yom Kippur relevant. Let's do that. I would love okay, to. Okay, we'll be in touch. Okay, have a great day. Thanks for coming on. Okay, bye. Thank you so much. No problem. Bye.